we start, um, I would like to administer the oath. So repeat after me. I am a Jew. Okay. I am a Jew. Do affirm that. Do affirm that. I will speak the truth. I will speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Um, we already spoke before, um, so you know that my name is Haraja Balagay. I will be questioning you today on behalf of the commissioners. I already note that there is a delay um, in the transmission, so um, let's be mindful of that, and I will allow you to finish what you're saying, and then I'll start speaking after a few seconds. I would also ask that you do the same. Okay. Do you understand? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Um, during my questioning, if at any point um, my questions are either unclear or you would like me to repeat, please feel free to do so. Just Thank ask you. me to repeat. I am mindful of the fact that you have been working all night and you might have had maybe about two hours sleep before starting this testimony, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, for your testimony, I will focus on four main topics. The first topic is about your, um, who you are, so your biographical information, educational background as well as work experience. Thereafter, I will focus on um, GAMSU as a student union body in the Gambia. So generally just about the mandate, composition and structure of GAMSU, as well as um, the ways in which information is disseminated. Um, and lastly, the relationship with state authorities. For the third topic, it would focus on the events of April 10, for the most part, and um, to some extent, April 11. We will talk about um, the incidents that led to um, the student demonstrations, as well as the meetings that you had with um, various state authorities. We will also talk about the executive meetings that um, GAMSU itself had um, prior to April 10. And then lastly, the fourth topic would be about events that um, occurred in Dakar, Senegal. That would be our last topic. Do you understand? Yes, I do. So I will start with the first topic um, concerning your biographical information. Can you please state your full name for the record? My name is... Can you tell us when and where you were born, Mr. Ju? I was born at Bakote uh, in what used to be the Kombu St. Mary's Division. Uh, now it's called Kanepin Municipal Area on the 4th of February, 1957. Can you tell us a bit about your educational background, including which schools you attended and the years when you attended those institutions? 
I did my primary school at Sukuta Primary from 1968 to 1973, during which period I did um, that, that if you, if if you look at that, you realize it's five years because after dropping my class in eighth, uh, primary one, I I was made to skip primary two. I was taken to primary three, and I continued that way up to primary six. And I started the Comorian examination in 1963. I was top of my school, top of my class, and I'm among and among the best men in the country. Um, just to interrupt so, you there, you said you sat your common entrance in 1963. Would that be oh, correct? 19, <laughs> 9, 1973. Indeed, so it took you five years instead of six years to do your primary education. Exactly. Yeah, because the, the, the headmaster at the time, who was Mr. Charles Fowley, uh, I thought that I could, I could cope with the, after my fourth year, he thought I would be able to cope with the primary school, uh, the demands of primary school. So he skipped, skipped me, I skipped primary school and went to primary school. Um, I, I, um, um, I, was, I was disappointed myself because I could not top the class that year. I came fourth, but uh, from that point onwards, I topped my class up to when we sat to the common entrance examination, I taught my class, I taught my school, and I was among the best 10 in the whole country. So I'd like to go through um, this um, quite quickly. Um, can you tell us where you went to for secondary education? Having, uh, from from good primary school, after having done so well at the common entrance, I had opted to go to Gambia High School, so expectations were that I would go to the Gambia High School. But when I went to Gambia High School, my parents were not able to provide an authentic birth certificate for me. And so I, it was difficult for me to go through the, the process of uh, uh, registration. But at the end of the process, the principal of Gambia High School suggested that since my papers were not correct, I should go to Crabbelon School. That was in 1973. So I went to Crabbelon School also. Mr. Baji was there then. He looked at my papers and suggested that I should go to Form 2 instead of Form 1. So I started that one too in Form 2. And instead of three years, instead of four years, I did it in three years. Uh, that was in 1976. And again, I was on the merit list for the whole country. So finally, I went to Gambia High School. I went to Gambia High School. In Gambia High School. Can you give us the dates when yes. you um, attended? I, I went to Gambia High School in, in September 1976. And uh, put in, in the... It, you know, Gambia High School had this A stream, B stream then. So because I came from a junior secondary school, I was put in, in Form 4B, which means I had to go through Form 4B, Form 5B, and then Upper 5B to in order to do my O-levels. So I went through that also and uh, did my O-levels in, in July, May, July of 1979. And again, I was able to go to the sixth one. Um, so um, when did I you did finally complete um, your education at Gambia High School? That would be the A-levels. I when finally did you com complete. Yeah, I, I completed my A-levels in 1981 at Gambia High School. Thank you very much for that. I'd like to move on briefly to your work experience. Um, upon completing um, your A-levels at Gambia High School, um, where did you work? After completing my A levels, I, I went to I went to the newsroom at Radio Gambia. I worked at the newsroom in Radio Gambia from early nineteen eighty two to nineteen eighty four. Then I left 
Gambia, uh, Radio Gambia. So I left Radio Gambia and went to the, what was the Gambia Commercial and Development Bank. I was enrolled there as a bank clerk. My first uh, station, my post, I was posted to the Grand Street ban branch where we used to pay uh, government salaries. And I uh, was at Grand Street branch for a little over one year, then I was posted to the Bacau branch. So can you tell and us when you finally um, stopped working at the Commercial and Development Bank? What year was that? I stopped working at the Commercial and Development Bank in 1986, around sometime in April. March, and thereafter, April. can you tell us um, what other job you held after the Commercial uh, Bank? I left the Commercial Bank and, and, and left the Commercial Bank at, by, um, as part of my community. Part of my community work was uh, I was part of a, a tasteful committee in my in my in my in my community at Bakode. Uh, we had built a, an elementary school, a primary school there. So when I left the bank, I was also a member of this that school committee. I was the secretary at the school committee. So I had known the headmaster uh, for years. Like he was my one of my teachers at primary school. That was the late Suleiman Jew. So I was I was brought in to help teach in grade six because they had they had just lost one of their great primary six teachers. So in, it was not exact, it was about the end of September 1986 that I started teaching there. And can you tell us for and how long I thought you taught at Bakote Primary School? I taught at Bakote, I taught at Bakote Primary School for six years. And in, in 1992, after having, after having enjoyed teaching and I decided to, um, to 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 build a career in in teaching. So I I went to Gambia College in 1992, September. And while you were at the Gambia College so, um, in 1992, after six. Sorry, can you hear me, Mr. Ju? Yes, I'm hearing you. Thank you. While you were at the Gambia College in 1992, um, did you join any students' union? Yes, I. In fact, I was. I was. I became part of the students' union. I did not become part of the student union only, but Gambia College had a number of uh, uh, other positions. Like uh, I, I first became the acting chairman of the Student Solidarity, Islamic Solidarity Association. And, and I was also made secretary of the Youth Front Against Drug and Alcohol Abuse before I was eventually made president of the Gambia College Students Main Union. This was in 1993. And can you tell us for how long you held that position as um, president of the Gambia College Students' Main Union? Um, it, it, the tenure was for one year. That it was an academic year from 1990, 1990 to 1994. Can you tell us um, what was your motivation for... Yeah. I'm sorry, um, can you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you. Can you tell us what was your motivation for um, being engaged in unionism um, within the context of student unions at the time? Um, even at the sixth form, I was part of the, the student organization. And um, I, I, had, I had, I started doing it even before, before I became part of the student organization like organization there i was also part of the debate team at, at gambia high school so and uh, i was engaged in sports in in other community activities so and some of the teachers 
some of them who were at Gambia College knew about my activities in the community and previously in the student movement at Gambia High School. Six form, what did we call then the six form union. So it was, I was identified and it was suggested to me by the, by the previous, by, by some, by the one who was the, the president of the of the student Spain Union who was then Emma Kanute and the others. So Ibrahim Kanute and the others, they were the ones who suggested that they would like me to run for president um, Gambia College Student Spain Union. And um, while you were president of the Gambia College Students Union, did you also hold another position simultaneously, simultaneously in another union? Yes, I, while I was president Gambia College Students Main Union, I, I also became president, vice president of GAMSU. Now, this is how that went about. Um, before I became president of Gambia College Students Main Union, there was, there was misunderstanding between high school students and college students as to who was to be uh, as to where the, the president of Gamsu should come from. And as a result, Gamsu was not functional during those years. But in my campaign to become president of Gambia College Students Main Union, I promised students that once elected president, I we would go in a rapprochement with Gamsu so that we could have a functional uh, uh, national student union. In fact, I, I was made president Gambia College Students Union main out, out to the polls on a post. And then um, we immediately started contacts with Gamsu. And then we put the, we started the pro putting the National Student Union uh, together again and making it functional. I'd like to focus on GAMSU itself um, as a student union body. Can you tell us a bit about what was GAMSU's mandate? GAMSU was basically, uh, since colonial days, basically um, it was mandated to overlook the welfare and the interests of Gambian students at the national level. It was as as a result of its full, uh, uh, pre independence background it had an element in, initially it had an element of uh, uh, it was a pressure group and and at the same time it was an interest group so and it brought together students from all over the country but at tertiary um, and juniors, what used to be initially high school and junior secondary school. Basically, her mandate was to uh, look after the welfare and interests of the students. Can you tell us a bit about what were some of the ways in which um, GAMSU carried out that function in relation to student welfare? GAMSU. It, GAMSU had two, it has always had two organs, that's the general executive and the central executive. And it has organs as well, like the, um, other, yeah, besides those two organs, it also has the social committee, advisory committee. Now, the social committee is most mainly used for, for fundraisers and things like that. And, and the advisory committee is, is used in conflict scenarios because advisory committee's membership expanded beyond uh, the student student population. Uh, people in the in the larger community were also invited into the advisory committee as well. So it's we we organize uh, those functions. We organize here during the um, International Students Day, uh, which normally falls around the seventh of uh, November every year, uh, there are organized symposia and, and functions like that to, 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 to kind of publicize student issues and hold debates on, on student issues, matters of student interest, basically. 
Uh, Gamsu also uh, produces um, a magazine which is biannual, to be a biannual magazine to kind of reach out to students and and publicize matters of interest to Gambian students as well. Thank you for that explanation. We've heard a little bit about the structure of Gamsu. Um, so I would just like to focus on one aspect of that structure, which is the central executive. Um, for the purposes of um, my questioning, can you just clarify if that's the highest organ of Gamsu? Yes, it is the highest organ of Gamsu. Can you tell us about the composition of, um, of that organ as of 1999-2000? Um, now, it, it was basically, the membership was elected at Congress, and it was made up of the President, the Vice President, the Secretary General, the Assistant Sec Secretary General. Uh, then you had the, the Treasurer, his Assistant, the Information Secretary, Public Relations Officer, and External Relations Officer. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are the elected members of the Central Committee, Committee. but we also had um, what we call ex officio members because they were not directly elected by, by Congress, they were elected by their uh, respective sub-unions, that is the, the President of uh, GTTI uh, Students' Union, President of Gambia, Gambia College Students' Main Union, and um, the President of MDI Student Union, but initially, initially this this uh, the the co-option of this ex officio uh, members was a lot is is kind of a lot of development. This I don't think was the case when I was vice president of Gamsu in 1993, 1990, 1993, 1994. It, it, it's a lot of development that these people were also made part of the central executive. So generally, the central executive, as of the period you have had to, consisted of um, 15 members. I, I would like to ask you a few questions about the membership in 1999-2000, and then we will address um, the relationship with the authorities and how that unfolded, which is something that you've um, just alluded to. So in 1999-2000, okay. can you give us the names of the President, Vice President, and the Secretary General of Gamsu? I, okay. I was the President, Omar Juf. The Vice President was Alaji Esda. The Secretary General was Senabu J. J. The Assistant Secretary General was uh, Daniel Davis. The treasurer was uh, Alassane Sise. Uh, I can't remember this, the, the assistant. Um, the, the auditor was um, Sanusi Drame. And then you had the information secretary was Alaji Kamara. The public relations officer was uh, Usman Ba. The uh, the external relations officer was uh, um, um, Babuka Jonga, and then you had the the this chairman of the advisory committee was uh, um, Babuka An disease. His assistant was uh, uh, was uh, um, Mabuk Jai. Uh, this is the members I can remember. Thank you very much for that. Can you clarify if the Secretary General was Sainabu J or Sainabu Gay? I was Sa J. 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 Sorry about that. Thank you for that clarification. J A Y E. J A Y E. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that one of the ways in which Gamsu disseminated information to students was through the biannual magazine. Can you tell yeah. us what were some of the other mechanisms that Gamsu used to disseminate information to students, to its student body? 
Uh, traditional information was spread through, like when we had meetings, we also had, as of that date, we had, um, as of the period you have referred to, we had, uh, we had some very active uh, regional organizers and uh, we would always also this, and we had phone contacts with them and we would always send information to them to the regions also um we would, we would do that and uh, by that time we had also acquired some in the sec there was a cell phone for the secretary uh, for the president and so that we had started using that modern technology to make calls and spread information as quickly as possible. Yeah. In terms of um, information flow from the executive to the um, regional representatives, would that go through the information um, secretary or would that be directly from the entire body to the regional representatives? Most of the time, they go through the information secretary, yes, and, and, and the information secretary works with the, uh, anything that has to do with the, with the, with the regional, with, the re, with our act, activities in the regions was directly under the portfolio of the vice president. So if, it had, if we had anything that had to go to the, to the uh, regions, both the vice president and the information secretary had to be in, involved. And generally, what was the format of um, the information that was disseminated? Was it written? Was it oral? Was it a combination of both? It was a question of uh, all of those. Like we, we would send letters. We would uh, we would make phone calls in the latter days. Uh, yes, and uh, we would we would also. Um, students are very good at uh, spreading information by word of mouth. So we, we, were, we were doing all those, those things, all of them. It was a mis mixed basket. What about access to the media? Did um, Gamsu have access to the media as a means of disseminating information to the student body? Oh, yes. Um, any student experienced with this will tell you that the media, the media is always a very potent source of means of spreading information. Um, we had good relations with the media houses in the Gambia, and particularly when the, um, the FM station started, we, we, were, we were regularly invited on programs in the um, FM radio stations, and whenever we sought the opportunity to, to to be on their programs, they had always uh, responded positively. Even when the television started, and I think there was, there are, yeah, there have been occasions when we use the televisions, television and the national radio uh, to spread information. Because I, I can remember very well um, when we started the Gamsu Trust Fund project, um, the vice president led a delegation to the Gambia uh, radio, to the television and, uh, they had some very good program to disseminate information about the Gamsu Trust Fund and so on. So we were, yes, we had access to, to those things like radio, television, and um, the print media. Yes, we had, we had access to all of them. So, Mr. Juf, in 1993 to 1994, you were the vice president of Gamsu. And then subsequent years um, down the line, yes, I was. from 1999 to 2001, you were the president of Gamsu. I would like to have your perspective on the relationship between Gamsu yes, I... and state authorities and how that relationship um, evolved to the extent that you know. Now, during my... During my... I have had two things. I mean, like, I have been in Gamsu twice. Uh, initially as vice president and then at uh, the time of the student demonstration in 2000 as president. Now, when we, so we operated 
during two regimes that is the the Jawara, both the Jawara regime and the and the the Yajame, uh, regime it the the, the backgrounds the environments were obviously different during the Jawara regime i think uh, the politicians actually left us to ourselves and um, hardly ever interfere in anything we had to do uh, it was um, I can remember all the way back to my high school days when we organized student demonstrations. They were, they were, um, uh, uh, when they were organized, they were mostly peaceful. And, and like I said, the patients hardly interfered in what we had to do. But the problem in those days, surprisingly, was mainly coming from the, uh, the technocrats, especially at the Ministry of Education, because I, I believe that the they use the difference uh, between college students and high school students in regard of who is supposed to be the guns to president is supposed to come from. They use it um, to 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 kind of put in place their own agenda on, on the student movement, which I believe is to kind of put the student union under control. Uh, that was the case, but when the the military regime came and uh, they started the July 22nd youth movement, their focus, number one focus was this movement. I, I remember when what we, we, we had informed students about uh, the, the, the advantages of staying non-partisan and the, and the and the, the drawbacks in the comparison. Um, so initially when they tried to try to involve students at Gambia College in the July 22nd youth movement is possible. We had sensitized students against becoming part of any political establishment. Um, so instantly, the the object of the the APRC administration and the APRC party became to 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 involve students to in their own activities that is to to recruit students and and make the student movement partners in their own politics so that's you, those those that's the different things yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about that, um, the efforts to involve students in the July 22nd movement? Yeah, I, because I remember in 19, uh, 1990, uh, 1996, around that time when, when they were forming it, um, our sister, sister um, Nimalani and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tam, was it Tamsi? They, they went to the Gambia College to recruit them, to ask them in the July 22nd youth movement, but the students refused to do so. And uh, but along the line, by the time I I became, I became I became president. By the time we took over the student um, um, movement, a uh, leadership of the student movement, Gamsu had a full blown relationship with the with the APRC and the president particularly through the July 22nd youth movement and when you that say is that the situation Gamsu, we found in place sorry to interrupt you um, when you say that Gamsu had a relationship with um, the president at the time through the July 22nd movement who in particular are you referring to within the July 22nd movement um, most of the activities from July 22nd uh, youth movement and were were mostly they were mostly led by the late Baba Job. It was like the main link between between Gamsu and the president. So when you took over as president in 1999, did that relationship um, with the July 22nd movement continue, or did that relationship change? Um, it was it was the relationship as we came on it was too it was too close for comfort it was it was definitely too close and we were not 
we were not comfortable about that because students had complaining about the prox proximity in terms of the relationship. For students, they still want the union to be non-partisan and they do not want Gamsu uh, so obvious hand in gloves with uh, with the with the regime. So what we did as as a as a national student leadership was to we instituted what we call um, a system of guarantee. We decided that um, no student leader in the Gambia should should force. Should not go. Should go to. No one should go to Kandilai without authority from us, and nobody was to make contacts with the president, Baba Job, the July twenty second youth movement, my predecessor Fakuru uh, Silla, and um, and there was some other individual. I was the lady who went, later became the uh, minister of information. This was. Um, um was it far to fight yes that was it we also put that lady in quarantine because we thought she was she was also trying to use gamsu for some other reasons so we put in place a system of quarantine and then that succeeded because um the only we had only one problem was this was uh some students went to Kandilai without our knowledge some students in the in the leadership and we wrote um we wrote warning letters strict warning letters to all of them so although when you came and, in um as a new executive you put in place a system of quarantine so preventing any contact between members of gamsu and um, the persons that you've mentioned other than yourself as president can you mm -hmm. tell us um, whether you had a good relationship with the authorities in spite of that or a bad relationship prior to March 2000? Up to that point, when we started initially, we, we, we started off, we inherited a very good relationship. So um, we maintain it because, as I have already alluded to, we are, we are a pressure group, but we are also an interest group. As, um, I remember way back we have we have had opportunities to explain this to the authorities, especially when Sana Sabali and the others visited us at Gambia College. But we had generally we had good relations with the with the regime because that was what we inherited. So we kept it, we maintained it. Now when we made that quarantine thing, we we instituted um better contacts, improved contacts with the Ministry of uh, the, this, the Department of State of Education. We started making monthly meetings with, uh, having monthly meetings with the SOS of Education and her team. So uh, while we were trying to scale down our contacts with the political class, uh, we were um, simultaneously developing contacts with the technocrats because we felt that um, with those people, our, our non party status would never be, be, be tampered with. So you mentioned very briefly the um, meeting that Gamsu had with um, Sana Sabali. Can you just give us the date and then we'll move on to um, other issues? Yeah, we had, that was, that was during my first stint as Vice President of Gamsu. That was at the Gambia College in on the around the nineteenth of nineteenth uh, of November, nineteen ninety four. So, as you said, you inherited a good relationship um, with the in, with the authorities, and this continued. Can you tell us? Um, mm -hmm. And now I'm focusing um, on March two thousand. Can you tell us generally what your role as president was at the time? Generally, as president of Gamsu, you, you, you coordinate the activities like, um, like I have explained. You are the chairman of the Central Executive Committee. So you, you organize those meetings. 
in collaboration with the Secretary General, you build up uh, the, your agenda, and when when you get to the meetings, then you split you the Secretary General or whatever is made up in terms of agenda it over to the to the President, and you proceed with your meeting. And the President also coordinates the activities, follows up the act, what whatever mandate or whatever assignment is given to other members of the executive committee. It's yeah, you you follow up those things as as they execute those plans on the ground, and um, like I have already alluded to, when it had to do with the with the provinces, you you will always have to uh, do that through the vice president and the information secretary. So yeah, generally that was my that and and I and I as president I led most of most delegations, and if I if I do, there have been instances when I thought, because of my experience, I should allow um, the other members of my of the executive to, I should give them of the opportunity to gather experiences as well. So, I have mostly allowed them, the vice president, to lead delegations or to lead programs on radio and television while I sit home and 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 observe them, and later we meet. I and give them advice and things like that. But yeah, the, the president was in everything. When the uh, information secretary is is publishing anything, or when he is, um, we also part of our fundraising is to print T-shirts and things like that. The president would still be in touch with him as he does those things and everything else. And um, as president, also I had control over. Uh, what was petty cash? Now, when I came in, when I came in, there was both petty and transport allowance. I, I, I said, this is, this is, this is not necessary. This is, I, I don't like it. I, I don't trust those manipulation accounts like that because it, it creates chances for corruption and things like that. So, I, I banned the transport allowance and um, we retained the. Uh, the we retain the the pass which used for uh, paying the fares of executive members as they travel to and from meetings and so on. So, yes, I Thank had you. control over that to the petticoats. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Ju. I'd like to focus on um, the events of March and April 2000, focusing first on the incidents that sparked um, the student demonstrations. Can you tell us about how you came to learn about those incidents and um, what measures were taken by Gamsu? Um, from, from around the weekend of the, the weekend of the 9th, 10th, 11th, or was it 10th, 11th? 12, that is uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I had come home from the provinces with uh, some other members of the executive committee. We had gone out to sensitize students about the Gansu Trust Fund. So when I came home, I I found a note there from the, um, an ex-official, a corrupted member of the central executive, Molo, Molos, Molo so or is it Molo Bal Molo Molo? That's his name, Molo. I can't remember the family name now. But he left a note to the effect that a girl had been um, raped at the Independence Stadium while there was, you know, an inter-school sports competition was going on there. Um, so that was. That was that weekend when I returned home. That was what I found. But already, um, I, I was also informed uh, by the, the vice president of Gamsu about the incident of a student at uh, Brikama Foster's senior secondary school who was involved with some teachers and some fire and ambulance service officials and ultimately lost his life the following day. I have from the vice president, uh, but the information in regard of uh, Bintamane, I got that from a note I found home, and it was left there by Molo for me. 
you've given us the name of um, the student um, that was um, involved in um, what happened at the Independent Stadium, um, the one that was um, allegedly raped. Can you give us the name of the student um, yeah. that you talked about regarding um, Foster's school? That was that was uh, Ibrahim Abari. Ibrahim Abari. So, can you tell us what are some of the um, measures that Gamsu took um, in relation to um, or in response to these two incidents? Now, what what we did was <clears throat> the vice president was was in Brikama then he, because he was he was he comes from Brikama, uh, he was at the Gambia College as well, so. We determined that he should cover whatever was going on in Brikama. And then I should let my other colleagues in covering what, whatever was around, you know, Banjul, Sarakunda, Bakao area. So that was how, what we did. Now, when I had that information, what I the, the about the rape case, what I did that Monday, I went to school at GTTI because I was doing attending lectures there. But after my lecture, my lecture was in the morning. After after the lecture, myself, the information secretary, Alaji Kamara, and the Depu assistant secretary general, uh, Daniel Davis, we went to Banjul. Uh, no, on that occasion, I went alone. I went alone. That was on Monday, the 13th. I went to I went straight to the Ministry of Education and in, asked them about what had happened. And, in, and I discussed it with them. I, I, they had already been informed about it. So um, we determined there for, to go to the hospital to, to look for the girl. So Myself, before you proceed to the hospital, Ms. Asen, Mr. Juf, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Before you proceed to the hospital, I'd like to focus on the meeting that you had um, at the Ministry of Education. Can you tell us who you had the meeting with? When I um, had the meeting, it was the uh, Chief Education Officer, it was then Dr. Ja. And the assistant director of education, Mr. Hassan Ju. Do you recall the first and name? And there was of Dr. a third Jack? body. I think it was Mohammed. I am not sure. You told us that um, you went there to inform them of um, the incident rega regarding um, the schoolgirl who was raped at the stadium, but they said they were already yes. aware of it. Can you tell us about yes. um, more information about the content of those discussions? Now, generally, we, what we did there, what we discussed was what what to do about uh, what to do that day about the the girl. Where is the girl? And, and it was confirmed that we discussed that the girl was hospitalized at the RBTH, and, and then we decided what on what should be done. So. In order to do all that, um, at the meeting, it was decided that we should go to the hospital to check on the girl. So, so prior to you was going to the hospital with um, officials of the Ministry of Education, as far as you know, mm -hmm. did they mention any steps that they had taken in order to address um, the situation? No. No. Unfortunately, no. Um, the unfortunate thing about this thing is that um, it was the student body that was initiating activities and actions all the time. So it was a result of my presence at the Ministry of Education that it was determined that uh, we should go to the hospital to check on the girl. Can you tell us um, who went with you from the Ministry of Education to the hospital, the RBH? As it was at the time, I, 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 I definitely, Mr. Hassan Juf was there. Um, I can't. It was. It was three of us went, but I cannot remember the other, the other person's name. But I, I do remember Mr. Hassan Juf. Yeah, because 
I had known him by then. Can you tell us um, what happened when you arrived at the RVH? Now, when we when we got to the RV um, RVTH, we were told that the girl had been discharged. Um, but and uh, the senior nurse in the ward at the gynae ward where she was uh, hospitalized, uh, she pulled out the 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 girl's hospital card and read what was written on it for us, which was like uh, an explanation of what had happened to her physically, you know, and um, it, it, in other words, um, she gave us information which was uh, indicative of the fact that, or was evidence that the girl had actually been raped. Um, and very briefly, did she provide you any information about the condition of the um, of um, the girl at the time? Yes, she said. She said by the time the girl came to the hospital and when they check on her, they found that she had been penetrated and that there were there were cuts and bruises on on her genitals. Uh, Miss, um, Mr. Juf, um, after that meeting at the RVH, um, where did you go next? Now, we were told that the girl left with, the, with her teacher, her head teacher and sports teachers. And, um, and, but they, they left for Gambia High School because Mr. Willika was, was also there and because he was the, the chairman of the school's inter-sports committee at the time. So we thought they had gone to Gambia High School, so we went to Gambia High School first. Or when we arrived at Gambia High School, we were told that um, they had gone to um, um, Bakau Police Station, but that's because that's the police station with jurisdiction over the area in which the incident took place. So we proceeded to uh, Bakau Police Station, where we found the girl has two sports teachers and the and the principal of our school. Do you recall the names of um, the two sports teachers as well as um, the principal of the school? Yes, the principal's name was Mr. Mendy, is it Mexican Mendy. Um, the I knew Ibrahim, the other sports, the male sports teacher, because he was my colleague at at Gambi College, um, Ibrahim Abba. And uh, I remember the name of the female sports teacher because I ended up taking her and the girl to my to my home, place at Bako. They had, that her name is um, Mariama Kamara, Miss Kamara. Yeah. Just the point of clarification: you mentioned that the name of the principal was Mr. Mendy. Um, you mentioned yes. the first name being Mexican. Is that correct? Is that what you stated? I, I I am not sure about that, but I think that was the. I'm not sure about the first name. I would generally call him Mr. Mendy at the time. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, this is based on your own recollection. Can you tell us what happened exactly. when you arrived at the Bakau Police Station? Now, when we arrived at the Bakau Police Station, there were two things that we needed to do. One that they needed to do. One was um, the issue of uh, a case file for uh, for the for the a case file for the the thing, and, and the other thing was uh, we had this question up of uh, um, identification. So sorry, can you say that again? What kind of parade? Two issues. Identification parade. I mean, because there was need for the girl to identify the person who allegedly raped her. So these were the two issues. But the most, uh, the most urgent one at that point in time when we arrived at Bakau Police Station was the was the case file. But they could not provide a case file. So and. Um, I think it's because the person who was supposed to prepare the case file was not there. So they suggested that we come back the next day. 
Um, Can you just which tell was, us who you spoke to at Bakao Police Station? Do you recall the name or names of the officers you spoke to? Yes, we spoke to Station Officer Fofana. That's, that's I can remember his name as Fofana. Station Officer Fofana. He was the Station Officer at the Bakao Police Station then. I take it that you don't recall his first name from what you've just said now. No, I cannot. I cannot. I cannot recall his name. No, he was S O Fofana. Now, now at the end of the day, we were not able to get the case, from, and of course, the identification period had to be planned. In it's not obvious to take place that day, so we did generally discuss the identification period. And I can remember emphasizing to the SOD in terms of having the ID period as quickly as possible. So, this was a traumatized girl taking her age into consideration, and if if the um, identification parade would take long, it may have memory affected. So we discussed those things. And it was concluded that we should return in day, which was uh, the uh, Tuesday, the 14th. So, so we had this us? issue of... Please, please proceed. Uh, can yeah yes uh, you want me to say something uh no i thought you had concluded so i was going to ask um what happened after you left bakao police station um where did you go next now okay what it was there was this issue of where would where would the girl go because the girl, girl came to those areas with her with her teachers so they were not sure whether she had relatives in the area and the principal said um, she could not take the girl home, but the the female sports teacher said she she could not take her home because where she was going to where she was being hosted, she had only she could where she was going to be hosted she could get space for only herself. And so I I suggested I I take the girl and the sport teacher to our compound at back hotel so they accepted so i went home with the with the female sports teacher and the girl and they spent that at my place at back hotel but the interesting thing is the moment we arrived on our premise my mother who who had inherited i mean like aspects of traditional midwifery from my grandmother loved that the girl was in pain because traditionally, my mother would take um, newly married girls to their house, and while they were being introduced into marriage, you know, um, the physical aspects of marriage, she would be continuing to take them there and assisting them physically in terms of their bodily needs and so on and so forth. So she was experienced enough in mind to to understand that the girl was in pain. So she asked whether she could help her. At that time, I was still with the officials from the Ministry of Education because we took them to Bakwate in the, that same vehicle. So um, they agreed. And and I and, and then we I I proceeded to Brikama with the same officials and left the girl at my place until the next day when we returned to uh, Bakau Police Station. Um, so, of course, um, your mother having had experience um, in relation to people who were be were married for the first time, um, that's a different scenario yeah. from um, an allegation concerning rape. Um, of course, that's totally different. Exactly. Yeah. That that was. Um, I think that what I'm trying to insinuate that is is what happens when whether people are are rape or whether they are newly married if for example you know in the gambia the fact of the matter is we celebrate virginity so um when girls are newly married they they wanted to identify that and obviously when it's there is still an element or some aspect of physical injury that needs to be treated that's that's what i'm that's what i'm insinuating here i'm just trying to be uh, careful with the language.
Indeed, I, I can tell. And your point is that she was um, visibly in pain. Um, one could tell from just yeah. um, observing her. We have about 15 minutes left for this session. Um, so you told us that you left, um, you left the girl as well as um, her teachers at your house, and you went somewhere else. Where did you go? I, I went to, I went with the uh, officials to Brikama. I went with them to Brikama because that was, um, it was our, our mission to Brikama had, was in connection with something else. It was, we, you know, we were all, we were all, um, they were all teachers. So they, and I was a teacher as well. So that was, it was about the time that they were giving out the one by six and uh, they wanted us and, and the team that was given one by six in the, in region one and so on had already left uh, Banjul and they were supposed to be in Brikama. So that was the why, reason I proceeded to Brikama with the officials from the of Education. We went there to our one by six loan from the government. So I'd like to proceed to the next day. Um, you were told by the um, Bakao police station, um, the station officer, Mr. Fofana, that you should return to the police station the next day. Can you tell us what happened? Yes, we, the next day we returned. Uh, when we returned, we found him actually at the other. Um, and the other, I went with the teacher and the, the female teacher and the girl and the, the, the headmaster and the other teacher uh, came to, also came to the station and, and we met there. And then we went to Mr. Fofana's office. And uh, Mr. Fofana called the person who was, uh, who was assigned to prepare his file. And then the person had already prepared the case file by the time we arrived. So he brought the case file to uh, S. Fofana. And uh, he received it there, and we we realized that a, a case file had been prepared. Um, case. Um, it, it was then that something very shocking happened. Um, Mr. S. O. Fofana then, after having received the case file, took a phone, the phone, and made a call. It was those phones in the past. Though we had those phones, they were not digital, so. When you're dialing it, you have it, you turn it round, the numbers round, round, round. And it was, when you are very close to somebody using them, you could, you could, you could hear what they were saying. I was the closest sitting to Mr. Fofana because I was at the edge of his table. Uh, he made the call and someone received the call, a male. When he spoke to the person and told the person that they, case file had been prepared and was ready, the person told him categorically and very clearly to me to take it easy with this case. You've already told us that you were sitting very close to Mr. Fofana, and so that's why you could hear what was being said um, on the other side of yes. the Yes. Do you know who he yeah. was talking to? I, I don't know who he was talking to because he did not mention a name. But apparently, and obviously to me, he was uh, speaking to someone um, up, up, the, up, up the ranks, someone high up the ranks compared to him. Because while they were speaking, he used the, he, he, he said, he used the word, sir, the title, sir. He said, yes, sir. So from that room that he was speaking to someone of a higher rank than him. So what you've, from what you've told us, Mr. Ju, Mr. Fofana called someone much more senior than him um, in terms of rank and informed that person that the case file concerning Ms. Mane um, had been prepared and it was ready. And from what you've said, that person responded, quote, take it easy on the case. Is that correct? Exactly, that's correct. 
you told us that that was a shocking experience for you. Can you tell us why? Um, my interpretation of, of, of the case, I mean, like, my, I, I, I am not someone who is normally pessimistic. I, I started to be pessimistic about the case from that point because I don't know why, but from that moment, when I started to suspect cover up, and I was really. I would still like to focus on um, the events in the office itself, Mr. Fofana's office. After he hung up the phone, was there mm -hmm. any discussion about the conversation that he had just had on the telephone? After he hung up, the first thing I observed about in terms of his body language was um, confusion, like like frustration, like he he has come against a wall. That was what I could read from his body language. Did you or anyone and, say anything to him about um, what you had just heard from the caller on the other line, on the other side of the phone? No. No, I am not even sure because I have never discussed it with the other parties in the in the office. Then, I am I am I am not even sure whether they have had it because I am sure no one has ever discussed it with them because I did not. So I I don't know about them because the interesting thing is from that point onwards, as the leader of Gamsu, I became very obsessed about having a resolution to e these issues. Than, uh, than spread, sharing any information with anybody which might jeopardize that, uh, that attainment because it, it was shocking to me and it, I believe it would have been shocking to other people, other parties if I had told them about them, uh, if I had told them about it. So I, I, I kept it to myself and still believe that we could find solutions to these issues. So just to make sure I understand, having heard um, a senior officer, presumably, a senior um, authority figure, tell station officer Fofana at Bakao Police Station to take it easy on Miss Mana's case file, your, um, your decision was not to discuss it because you didn't want to aggravate the situation. Is that a fair... Um, exactly. Okay. That's, that's a correct assessment of my position. Yeah, that's well. Right. Thank you very much. What about the content of the case file? Did you at any point, um, were you informed of the content of the case file? Or did you, um, were you allowed to see the case file? No, we were, n we were not allowed to see the case file. But, but we, we saw the case file, physically, the file, the physical file. And um, yes, and, and we left it with Mr. Fof uh, S.O. Fofana. And as far as you are um, aware, based on um, your presence the day before, as well as um, that second day at the police station, do you know if a statement was taken from Ms. Mane at all? At the police station, uh, yes, yes. Uh, Ms. Mane and, uh, and the teacher they all gave statements at the police station. You mentioned that following the conversation that S.O. Fofana had, um, you sense a change in um, the attitude of, um, of the police regarding the case. Can you tell us more about that? Um, from that point, the, 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 next, the next most important thing was the, um, the ID part identification parade now this was this was the on the 14th of, uh, of March. now uh, schools were going to close the next that Friday schools were closing that Friday because it was early the next week and schools were going out on vacation so if for example an ID parade is not held between that that Tuesday and Monday, then it means it would not be held again until um, P 
people come back on from from the Eid, which was going to be on the twentieth. Then, so it it became very important to us, and and I and I started to feel the feel the pressure in regard of the need, the very urgent need for an identification parade. And but even after after we press we press that, but they could not provide for an identification parade. They could not provide for an identification parade within that week, which means also that uh, up to Monday, which means also that the, the, the victim and her teachers had to go back to the provinces and come back after it. Did they explain which why was, they couldn't conduct an identification parade prior to the holiday? Period? No, they no, they did not. It, it's that's what I that's what I realized about the case at that point. They generally had started dragging their feet in connection with the case. Everything they started dragging their feet, and you absolutely had to put pressure on them. And in terms of the pressure, there was just, I mean, like there was, it was just about, there wasn't much that we could do at that point in time. So we just kept talking to them. So in fact, what I did was after that day, they went away. When we dispersed at Bakao police station, the understanding was there was not going to be a, a, an ID parade until after, um, after Eid, and we all dispersed. But I, so I had to go back to the Ministry of Education the next day to kind of give them a suitable report because when we went, went back to the police station the following day, uh, there was none of them there. So I went to Banjul again um, the following day to give them a suitable report on this. So what, from what you've said, you've kept the Ministry of Education abreast of the issues um, as events were unfolding. Can you tell us who you met at the Ministry of Education um, the second time around? I, I would always meet the, mostly the, 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 the Deputy Director of Education, admin, it was, he was admin, and the Chief Education Officer. At the time, yes, uh, Doctor 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 Ja and um, Mr. Hassan Ju. And what was the reaction um, of the officials at the Ministry of Education to your update? They didn't like. Of course, they didn't like what was happening. They did not like what was happening. I, I can remember them praising us, the student leadership, for you know, maintaining um, a system of continuous follow-up on the case, like that, on a daily basis. Um, but from their end, they were not doing anything. They were not doing anything. They were just, I was going there, giving them information. And then, and then, and even when there was, uh, I mean, like a, a, an ID parade, I informed them of the time of the ID parade and they sent one person to attend the ID parade. So thank you for the information that you've provided, provided regarding Ms. Mane. She was, of course, very young at the time. It was her first time in the, um, in the greater Banjul area. So it's very helpful. She was very young. I think she must have been, she must have been 12, 13 at the time. Indeed. So it's very helpful to have other people provide information from their perspective. But I'd like to end that issue by asking one last question, which is concerning the identification parade itself. Um, can you tell us what happened when it was finally held? Yes, the, the identification parade happened after, um, after Eid. Um, the girl came down, um, I think that was, yes, almost a Monday after the, the Monday after the, the, the Eid, and it was around the 20th, which was around about, I think it was on a Wednesday, yes. So the following week, early the following week, they called us for 
for the ID parade. And we went to the ID parade. I, I went there. Um, and then the Ministry of Education, uh, second, uh, like they, yeah, they sent an individual, one of their officials to attend as well. And the girl was there with a, one of our parents and, the and a witness. So the parade was, was put in effect and the girl went around and uh, could not could not identify who allegedly raped her. But we were all, after that, we were all asked to make statements because the press was there as well. And my reaction was that an identification parade is not the last item in the police investigation toolbox. I, I told them this. I said, um, the police still continue the investigation through other means. Because uh, this, this is it. This should not be end of story. Just to make sure I understood something you said, Mr. Ju, the press was present um, during the incident where the identification parade was um, being conducted at the Bacau police station. Is that correct? No, it was at police headquarters in Bandul. At police headquarters. But yes. The press yes. were present during that. It, it, yes, it public. Yes, it was a public. It was a public thing. It was who were not kept away. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I will leave it at that because we need to take the lunch break. Um, when we come back, we will focus more on the meetings that you had with the authorities. You've already told us that it was your vice president, um, Alaji Asabo. Okay who was involved in the issues concerning Mr. Ibrahim Abari. So we won't, con um, we won't cover that. But we'll just move on to the meeting. Yeah, I think I, I think I, uh, excuse me, I think I attended only one meeting in regard of that at Gambia College, yes. Um, we'll talk about that briefly and then focus on the other meetings you had with the authorities. Thank you very okay. much for answering right. my question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Emma Council, and thank you, Mr. Juf. We will take a, a, a lunch break and resume at um, 3 o'clock sharp. Meeting is adjourned.